If you follow the indie horror game scene long enough, you end up seeing some names pop up frequently. Indie gaming is, by its nature, a place that sees auteurs pop up fairly regularly. Names like Kitty Horror Show or Dusk Dev, who are consistently putting out good work, and who you can come to trust will always deliver a solid experience. One of my favorite of these indie horror auteurs is Akuma Kira, aka Kira, aka Kira LLC. If you know any of Kira's work, it's probably 2014's Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion. That was Kira's breakout game, and is still the most well-known game they've made. They have quietly gone on to become, in my opinion, one of the best talents currently working in the indie horror scene. Every major release from Kira has been better than the last, but while Spooky has seen enduring popularity to this day, I don't see nearly as much conversation around 2018's Lost in Vivo, and I've hardly seen any coverage of Lunacid, which hit early access in 2022 and is now approaching its full release today, if I've posted this when I plan to, as we speak. If we use the number of Steam reviews as a general barometer of interest and exposure for a game, we can see Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion sitting very close to an impressive 14,000, while Kira's next major release, Lost in Vivo, has just 2,600, and Lunacid has around 2,500. Kira also has a ton of smaller releases, available on sites like itch.io or in collections, some of which are incredibly cool and incredibly impressive. Things like Uctena 64, Basilisk 2000, or Corpse Ocean, games with virtually no conversation online. That's a shame, because the games of Akuma Kira are very, very cool. The conversation around these games shouldn't be relegated to Kira's Discord server, and a handful of old Let's Plays and lore videos. These games need more exposure, they need more attention. So I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I have played, to my knowledge, everything Kira has ever publicly released for this video. When I say everything, I mean I went on their Game Jolt page for some of these deep cuts. Did you guys know Game Jolt was still around? I thought Itch.io had pretty much replaced it. Now, as a Halloween special, God, I hope it's Halloween when I'm posting this, I want to go through that catalog of horrors and explain what's special about each and every one of them. This is a broad swath of titles, ranging from horror comedy to straight horror to dark fantasy, with genres ranging from walking simulator to survival horror to dungeon crawler to submarine simulator to whatever genre you would describe Basilisk 2000 as. Kira has never rested on their laurels. Kira has never released the same type of game twice. Because of that, you might not want to play all of the games here, but if you like horror at all, then I am confident there is at least something here which you need to play. This video is about the games of Akamakira, but I also think it's important to acknowledge, since I am largely framing this video as being about the works of a specific person, that Kira isn't the only one who worked on them. I don't have insight into the development process of these games beyond just looking at the credits. I don't know Akamakira, so I don't know the specifics of what other people did on these games, but there are other names in the credits, and not just as actors. They largely seem to be one-person projects, but there are some names that pop up repeatedly. Jaron Christ is a frequent collaborator responsible for much of the music in these games. The original Spooky's House of Jump Scares has a second programmer listed, Sheena Perez. The HD remake of Spooky's, which I'll be playing for this video, and which included 3D models instead of sprites, has a full team listed who worked on it, Albino Moose Games. Lunacid's soundtrack has contributions from a bunch of people, including names I recognize, like Thor High Heels. 
I also am going to be talking about these games in the context of being Kira games, because that is the thread that sews them all together, and I'm going to talk about what I think these games are about and what they're saying as artistic works, but I don't want to say, this is what Kira means, or this is what Kira thinks, because I do not know. I don't even have a parasocial relationship with Kira. I don't follow them on social media, I'm not an active user of their Discord, I'm just a fan of their work. To be frank, I don't really want to know more about Kira outside of their name while I'm working on this video, because I think artistic works should stand on their own, and I think the work of Akuma Kira does. That work is what I want to talk about today. While the point of this video isn't a big lore or story explanation, those videos exist, at least for Spookies and Lost in Vivo if you want them, I am going to be talking about the themes, the stories, and how they connect in this video, including some of the endings of these games. Specifically, I'm going to need to talk explicitly about the secret ending of Lost in Vivo, since it provides pretty important context for some of Kira's later games. Personally, I don't think you really need to worry too much. The stories of these games are interesting and good, but I don't think the experience of those stories and how they are presented will be ruined by knowing what I'll be talking about in this video. However, if you are spoiler-averse and are willing to just take me at my word that these games are cool and good, they're all pretty cheap, in the $10 to $20 range for the ones that are paid at all. The original Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion is still free to play, and all of the smaller itch.io titles I'll be talking about are free, except for Basilisk 2000, which costs the whole $2. Give these games a try. I do not think you'll be disappointed. If you have already played these games, or want to be further sold on why you should care, then hey, let's do this. I think it only makes sense to start with the most well-known game in this catalog. So let's talk about Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion. Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion, nay Spooky's House of Jump Scares, I'll be using the names interchangeably, is a 2014 horror comedy game by Lag Studios, and the breakout hit of Lag Studios founder, Akuma Kira. It was originally released under the name Spooky's House of Jump Scares, but due to a cease and desist from the mobile game developers Spooky House Studios, who demanded the name be changed, the title became Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion in May of 2016. The original release of the game is still available on Steam, completely for free, with a paid DLC called Karamari Hospital, released in 2015, available for $2, and a second DLC released all the way in 2020 called The Dollhouse, or Spooky's Dollhouse, available for $4. However, in 2017, a remake of the game built in Unity rather than Game Maker was released called Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion HD Renovation, which costs $10 and which includes both DLCs. This remade version was later ported on consoles and can be found on PS4, Xbox One, and Switch. I played the original release of Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion way back in 2015 or so, when it was still called Spooky's House of Jump Scares, but for the purposes of today's video, I'll be talking about and showing footage of the HD renovation version. And if you're interested in playing the game, which you should be, and you can swing 10 bucks, I recommend picking up the HD renovation version. If you haven't played Spooky's House of Jump Scares, I think it's easy to glance at and lump it in with a lot of those streamer horror games. You know the ones. Your Slenders, the Eight Pages, your FNAFs, your... I don't know, what do the kids like right now? Garten of Banban? -Ban? That's not to disparage those games. Well, maybe I'm disparaging Garden of Banban. -Ban. But, you know, those games that feel like they were made to prank streamers and make them go, ACK! More than to be actually played by people. I mean, the updated re-release of Spooky even has Twitch's built-in crowd control integration. It's not an unfair comparison to make. A lot of those streamer horror games are built around a central hook or central twist, and then once you've seen that trick, they're pretty played out. Spookies is also built around a central hook, a central joke, but if it does fit into that subgenre because of that, then it's my favorite entry in that genre, simply because it's so well executed. 
The central joke of Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion, if you've never played it or heard of it before, is that it is on the surface a very bright and colorful and kid-friendly game, which slowly builds into a cacophony of actually very effective and often grotesque horrors. You arrive in Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion, a legendary house of frights, and are challenged to survive 1,000 rooms. Spooky herself is an adorable little ghost girl with a goofy, high-pitched voice. So, you made it this far. That's, uh, that's great. As you walk through the first few rooms, adorable and friendly cardboard cutouts jump out at you and play a scare chord to startle you. It does have jump scare right in the title, after all. Later on, though, as you go, you start encountering more monsters, specimens as they're called in the game, and they get increasingly disturbing. A slimy ectoplasmic ghost, a wall of flesh that tries to trap you into corners and crush you to death, some sort of ancient deer god entity who whispers terrible things to you. The flesh the one which legitimately makes my skin crawl every time, a terrible centipede tarantula. I hate this one because it likes to fall down from the ceiling right on top of you, and unlike most of the other specimens, its audio cue is very subtle, just a slight scratching sound as it crawls towards you. As a game, Spookies is often described as a walking simulator. That's not fully accurate, there are weapons later on, and there's even a boss fight eventually, but it does get to the spirit of the core gameplay. You are walking from room to room. Your goal is to get to room 1000. There are some scripted events and scripted rooms which you will always encounter at the same points in the game, usually used to introduce a new specimen, but for the most part you're wandering through randomized sets of rooms. There are not nearly as many room layouts as there are random rooms you'll walk through, meaning you will walk through the same room dozens of times. Most of the rooms have multiple exits, and it doesn't actually matter what exit to a room you use. There are no dead-end paths, at least not in terms of dead-end rooms entirely, and there's no backtracking to previous rooms. If you can move forward through a room, then that is the right path forward. It's as good as any other door is. This might sound like it gets repetitive and boring. Your mileage may vary, but I actually don't think so. I think the use of these randomized rooms and the way you repeat them over and over again is pretty crucial to the core gameplay loop of the game. It is important that you get the same rooms over and over and over again, because you need to have them memorized for later sections of the game. That process of learning to navigate these rooms quickly is the core gameplay of Spookies. Let me ask you a question. What is gameplay? When reviewing games, people talk about gameplay a lot, but it's a very vague term. To ask it another way, does gameplay only entail the actual pushing of the buttons on the controller, or does it include what happens in your mind while you are playing too? When you play a puzzle game, say Portal, is the gameplay literally just the pushing of buttons and the movement of your character? No, of course not. The actual process of solving puzzles, poking at the game, and figuring it out in your head before executing it in the game, that's gameplay. If you're playing a game without a map, let's say Dark Souls, I would argue that the process of internalizing the level layouts is also a part of the gameplay. This is what I think people miss when they describe Spookies as a walking simulator. The core gameplay loop isn't just literally walking forward, reading notes, and listening to dialogue like, say, Firewatch is. That's what I think a walking simulator describes. And hey, I'm not saying walking simulators are bad. I like Firewatch, I like The Beginner's Guide, I like PT, but the core gameplay loop of Spookies is about navigation. The game is testing you on a technical level in a way true walking simulators don't. The first way the game tests you is, of course, by having scary monsters chase you. Specimen 2, that ectoplasmic slime ghost I mentioned earlier, just flies straight at you. There are puddles of slime you have to avoid because they slow you down. 
Later enemies, though, test you in different and more surreal ways. Specimen 5, which is this sort of mannequin creature, will change all of the textures in a room, except for the door, to the same looping nightmare textures a moment after it enters the room. The effect is incredibly disorienting, as it messes with your depth perception and ability to determine where one object ends and another begins. Because of this, it's incredibly important that you've learned at least the general layout of the rooms by heart by the point Specimen 5 is introduced in Room 210, because you get a short glimpse of the room before the specimen enters, so you need to recognize what layout you have on site if you are going to effectively outrun the monster. Specimen 6, who looks like the Elegy of Emptiness from Majora's Mask, aka Ben Drowned, can mess you up extremely quickly if you let it. But it can also only move when you aren't looking at it. This means you need to, again, be able to quickly recognize these rooms on sight well enough that you're able to navigate them backwards without looking, so you can keep your eyes on the monster for as long as possible. Specimen 7, that nightmare meat wall that slowly approaches you I mentioned earlier, likes to appear in hallways with dead ends. If you don't know the layout, you can easily get boxed in and crushed to death for an instant game over. Other monsters, like Specimen 11, are able to phase through walls. That makes things extra tricky because you have to either know the room layouts well enough that you're able to juke the monster around so you can safely make it to your destination, or else go deliberately slow enough that the monster is always just behind you. Specimen 11 also makes the exit doors to the room disappear. They're still there, they're still usable, they're just invisible now, so I hope you were paying enough attention to where they were in this room layout before. This is the secret sauce that makes this game work as a game. This is why Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion has to be a game, and not a book or a movie, which is a common and, I think, often accurate criticism of walking simulator games. Each of the specimens is putting the player's knowledge of what they've seen so far to the test in a different, unique way. It is relying on the player's active engagement with the environment. This is a very well-made game with a very unique gameplay hook. It is a game about traversal, about effective and efficient navigation above all else. And then, of course, there are the jump scares. See, those cardboard cutout jump scares I mentioned earlier, they don't go away. And let me tell you, they're a lot more effective when you are being chased by a killer mannequin. Also, now they look like this sometimes. Jump scares are a controversial topic among horror fans. I most commonly these days see horror fans talk about jump scares with disdain, that they are the lowest form of horror. I get why. They're the easiest way to frighten someone. If you show something scary all of the sudden when someone isn't expecting it, then they will have a physical response to it, if only for a second. It's cheap. It's easier than effective writing and atmosphere, which conveys dread. Like all things, though, I think there are good examples of jump scares, and bad examples of jump scares. Jump scares can be an effective tool for horror, real horror, when used effectively. There's an art to crafting an effective jump scare, a truly good jump scare, and those with a talent for it can make incredibly memorable moments of horror. Jump scares, on their own, don't work for horror. It's the joke at the very beginning of this game. A cardboard cutout jumps out at you. You might flinch, but it's not scary. But while you're being chased by a monster, one hot on your tail, often one faster than you are, and then suddenly that same cardboard cutout jumps out at you and blocks your progress, even just for a moment, that's scary. It's also a really good joke, a joke that is completely at the player's expense. Like the game is saying, remember when this wasn't scary at all? Gotcha. Yes, it is genuinely scary now in the proper context, and it's also a very funny joke all at the same time. Because, of course it is. Comedy and horror are essentially linked. Two guys walk into a bar. The third, ducks. A punchline is just the comedy equivalent of a jump scare. You think you know where a train of thought is going, only to realize you've been on the wrong train entirely, and 
Actually, wait, is this a bus? So why not make a jump scare a punchline? In your id, caveman, lizard brain, whatever you want to call it, fear, that visceral fear you feel in your gut, is the sensation of panic when you spot a tiger stalking you from a bush. Laughter is the feeling of relief you get when you realize it was just your buddy wearing some tiger pelts scaring the crap out of you. Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion is a brilliant use of comedy and horror together, hand in hand. My favorite example of this is when you reach room 750, and Spooky gives you a gift. Unlimited stamina. Oh hi, I didn't think you'd make it this far. And you got an axe. Thanks. Well, congratulations. You're just about there, I think. Well, I didn't really have a gift ready, so um... This upgrade gives you unlimited stamina by removing your ability to run. Think about how effective this joke is at serving multiple purposes. Not only is it a very funny joke, again, at the player's expense, it also effectively makes the game tenser and scarier, at least until the effect wears off and you regain your ability to run after a few rooms. It hits both the horror and the comedy, all at the same time. Another important element of the game is the mansion itself. Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion predates the widespread popularity of this term, but I personally think it qualifies as a pretty strong entry into the liminal horror category buzzword of the day. Most of the rooms you're navigating are hallways or stairwells. Often you'll come across a more specific room with theoretically a purpose like a bedroom, but it won't be quite right. Several beds arranged in a way no human would ever put them. It gives the vibe that this house wasn't built as much as it metastasized. Like these rooms grew with only a vague sense of purpose, but not intelligent design. There are a few works in other mediums which Spooky's House of Jump Scares reminds me of quite a lot. SCP-184, The Architect, is one of those. That also hits on this theme of what appears to be a man-made space growing out in ways that would not serve any human purpose. Another work which this game reminds me a lot of is No End House, either the original creepypasta or the Channel Zero adaptation. Take your pick. The comparisons here are pretty self-evident if you've ever read the story, which is about a haunted house attraction, the kind you see people set up every Halloween, that claims to be the scariest haunted house of all time, and offers a $500 prize to anyone who can make it through the whole thing. Of course, the trick to the story is that the no-end house is genuinely supernatural, and as the title implies, it's not the sort of haunted house you ever leave. If you've never read the story or seen the TV show adaptation of it, it's a solid read. I really enjoy it. I'm not saying either work was inspired by the other, I, I don't know, and to be honest I'm not even sure on the timeline when No End House was first written, but they do have very similar premises, and I think as a result, Spookies sort of ends up working as the best video game version of No End House I could imagine. Another work which Spookies reminds me of, the last one I want to mention directly, is Mark Z. Danielewski's postmodern horror novel, House of Leaves. <laughs> Overall, Spookies Jumpscare Mansion is just perfect. It's so well put together, so full of memorable monsters, and neat tricks to play on the player, and legitimately very funny jokes. Comedy games are hard, comedic timing is hard to pull off in an environment where the player is in control of the speed of the game, and yet here we see it done masterfully. The jokes, the scares, and the gameplay are all perfectly in sync. I'm not saying it's the greatest game of all time or anything. Again, I think there are at least two better games yet to come in this video. But when I say it's perfect, I mean that I can't think of anything that it could do better or that it should change. It is the best possible iteration of the game it's trying to be that I can imagine. 
If you haven't played it yet, even though I've talked about a lot of the things that happen in the game, I don't think that matters. Even if you've watched someone play the game in full, you should go play it. Playing it, having it in your own hands, is a different experience, and it is worth your time. While the original Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion was free to play, it later received two paid DLCs, both of which are included in the HD renovation version. There's also an endless mode with some unique monsters that can only be found there, but I haven't actually played endless mode, it's not that interesting to me, so that mention is all it's getting in this video. Both of the DLCs drift away from the gameplay loop and randomized nature of the main game to focus on giving the player a specific set space to explore. Each DLC can be completed in 30 minutes to an hour. The first DLC, Karamari Hospital, was released in December 2015. It starts by positioning itself as a sort of alternate ending to the main game, beginning in room number 995 before diverging and taking you deep, deep below the mansion, into an unknown room number. Spooky shows up at the very beginning and tells you that she forgot there was even anything down this far. As you move along, you find yourself inside the titular Karamari Hospital, a strange, abandoned, spooky hospital you need to navigate by finding keys and other items that let you progress. This is much more similar in style to a traditional survival horror game than it is the game it's connected to. Karamari Hospital is good. It's a good horror game. But it also doesn't really feel like a DLC for Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion. The game was actually sold as a standalone. You don't need to have the main game installed to play it. Where both DLCs play completely differently from the main game, the second DLC is at least directly connected to the story of the main game, while Karamari Hospital is pretty much a non sequitur. There's nothing in it I'd describe as a joke, except for maybe the existence of a dating sim minigame, Sunshine Academy, you can find in one of the rooms. The main game had arcade minigames of its own, and the second DLC also introduces one. It's a lot more serious and playing the horror completely straight, as opposed to the whole thing kind of feeling like a prank on the player. Again, it's good, it's definitely the scariest piece of content for the game, but I question why it had to be connected to Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion at all. There's a single note providing some lore about Spooky herself you can find toward the end of the game, and of course, the intro and ending feature Spooky directly, but if you cut those pieces off, it's a completely disconnected horror game set in an abandoned hospital. This leads to it feeling more like a bridge between Spooky and Kira's next full project, Lost in Vivo. At the same time, it doesn't really have any of its own unique gameplay hooks, which ends with it feeling a bit... generic. There are some pretty cool easter eggs if you play through it a second time on New Game Plus mode. One of the defining characteristics of Kira's work overall is a ton of easter eggs and extremely hidden content. The main game of Spookies had a bit of that, there's a secret code you can find which gives you a bit more information about Spookies' background, but this is a lot closer to some of the insanely cool easter eggs you can find in later games. Specifically, if you're playing on New Game Plus, you can pull a sword out of a painting which is actually able to hurt the enemies in the hospital area, unlike your default axe. If you kill everything in the DLC, you can get a slightly altered ending and an achievement. It's neat. The idea of a slightly different New Game Plus mode with some additional scares was later expanded in Lost in Vivo, which also makes this feel like a bit of a transition between games. Should you play it? Absolutely. Kira's work is all great, and this game costs $2 if you didn't spring for the HD renovation version. It just doesn't feel like it has much of its own identity beyond being a pretty good little 30-minute horror game, and as a result, that means I end up thinking of it as one of Kira's lesser works. I'd put this a lot closer to some of the Ichio titles we're going to talk about in a bit than I would the main game. Honestly, of all the products Kira has that actually cost money to play, this is probably my least favorite. The Dollhouse is a huge improvement over Karamari Hospital, however. 
It also came out a shocking amount of time after the original game. The base game was first released in 2014, then Karamari Hospital was released in 2015, but The Dollhouse, which serves as a definitive conclusion to Spooky's story, wasn't released until October of 2020. I'm guessing there's at least some people watching this video who played and liked Spookies way back when it came out who have no idea this DLC even exists, given that it currently has just 88 reviews on Steam. Granted, I'm guessing most people probably played it inside of HD Renovation, but even that was released over three years before the DLC was, and has a fraction of the reviews the original game has on Steam to this day. That's a shame, because the dollhouse is really good. While it abandons the random hallways of the main game in favor of a large static location to explore, it has its own unique gameplay mechanics to replace the core appeal of the main game, now lost. Unlike the main game, your health will no longer regenerate in this DLC. Instead, you have a haunted doll you carry with you throughout the DLC. The haunted doll is possessed by the spirit of a child and will grow attached to you. You can use the doll to heal yourself should you take damage. However, as the doll becomes increasingly distressed, either from being left behind by you or from being exposed to danger for too long, it loses effectiveness. You need to take care of your doll primarily by having a tea party with it in a room which is available early on. The DLC takes place immediately after the end of Karamari Hospital, going even deeper into this forgotten section of Spooky's mansion. Narratively, this DLC takes the overall story of Spooky much more seriously than the main game does, and serves to give it a proper ending, since the original game's ending is something of a troll. You even get to find out more about Spooky herself and her backstory. In the immortal words of Paul from Petscop, That's a dead kid. There's a new batch of enemies here, primarily dolls which have been abandoned and left to rot for countless years in the deepest parts of the facility. My favorite of the new enemy designs is Wormy Charles. That's Wormy with two O's, just a really great, creepy design. Although taking your doll with you is important to keep it happy, it's not always an option. The DLC is full of pressure plates that require setting your doll down in order to open various doors, usually leading to danger. My biggest complaint with the DLC is that the alternate ending is a little bit annoying to get. In order to access it, you need to get three black candles from an area called the Root Cellar in order to set up a ritual. The part that's annoying is that, although the root cellar is a mandatory section in the game, and you can see the candles right there when you're going through it the first time, you can't pick them up that first time through. You have to go find the ritual circle to know you need them, then backtrack all the way to the other side of the DLC to go pick the candles up. Once you get the candles, you have to do a chase sequence of something like 15 or 20 rooms against one of the specimens from the base game. These chase sequences are much harder than the chases from the base game, both because of their layout and because your health doesn't regenerate, and it feels like at certain points taking damage is borderline mandatory. It's fine, it's the secret final ending for the final major piece of content for the game. The thing that is a bit annoying, though, is that this is marketed as the big conclusion to Spooky's Jumpscare Mansion. And it is. It's a perfectly satisfying ending. If you get the secret alternate ending. The main ending you'll get your first time through just kind of sucks. It's not satisfying, so to lock the proper ending behind busy work, like backtracking to grab some candles, is just annoying. I think this was better handled in Lost in Vivo, which we haven't talked about yet, but came out before this DLC did. That has a similarly obscure and easy to miss ending, which requires some backtracking you wouldn't think to do your first time through, but there, it's a proper secret ending. An ending that feels like an easter egg, rather than the real, proper ending to the story. Overall, small nitpicks aside, if you didn't know it exists, or you haven't gotten around to it, but have any affinity for Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion at all, you should really go play it. The DLC for the original version is $4. If you ever bought HD Renovation, then congratulations, you already own the dollhouse. 
It takes about an hour to play, even if you're getting the secret alternate ending, and that alternate ending is good and worth playing. It's nice to see Spookies get a definitive final piece of content like this, which feels like it wraps a bow on the whole game. That is Spooky's House of Jump Scares. Or Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion. Or... I keep accidentally calling it Spooky's Jump Scare Manor in my script. That's not what it's called. I'm gonna try to fix that before I record, but I'm sorry if I accidentally drop a manor somewhere in this video. I've just been calling it Spooky's House of Jump Scares for years, and I think I thought the rename was Manor until I started working on this video. The name change messes with my head. I don't think Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion actually rolls off the tongue very well. This is a hyper-specific nitpick, and I am not suggesting they rename the game again, but I think that's why I keep trying to say Manor. I just don't think Jump Scare Mansion scans well for some reason. In any case, let's move on to talk about Kira's second major release, Lost in Vivo. Note, things are going to get a little heavy in this section. This game deals with some serious topics. We're going to be talking about things like body image problems, coping with trauma, severe anxiety, eating disorders, and if you're not up for that, I recommend skipping ahead past this section of the video. The video is broken into chapters below, just click ahead to the Uctena 64 chapter. Where Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion is horror comedy, Lost in Vivo is just horror. Where Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion is very simplistic in its gameplay, at least in terms of the verbs which are available to the player, Lost in Vivo expands its scope into being a full-on survival horror game. The premise is simple. You're taking your dog out for a walk when a sudden storm hits and washes your very good pupper away into a storm drain. Now you have to go search the sewers, which get increasingly surreal and increasingly haunted as you go. Your dog needs saving, so it's time to go John Wick all over some ghost asses. Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion did eventually give you an axe, which you could use to defend yourself from some monsters, but it didn't really incorporate that into a full-on combat system. Lost in Vivo, by comparison, has multiple weapons, ammo to keep track of, and even a blocking system to defend yourself from further damage. Although, you don't have hands, so you just sort of telekinetically hold the weapons hovering in front of you. Personally, my headcanon is that this means the player character is actually Larry the Cucumber. The combat itself is nothing to write home about. It's serviceable. It's not amazing. There are several weapons, but the shotgun sucks, and the first gun you get, the pistol, fires as fast as you can pull the trigger, which means it comically outclasses every other weapon in the game. Combat in a survival horror game being kind of bad is hardly a fatal flaw. If anything, I think the combat being bad in games like the original Silent Hill trilogy adds to the horror of it. The final boss of Lost in Vivo also sucks. You have to drop this heavy door on it, but you can't manually drop the door, you can only raise it, meaning you have to time it so that the boss reaches you right as the door falls, which is easier said than done, or else take a couple hits to stun it. It's just janky and doesn't work well. If I were going to seriously penalize a survival horror game for having a bad final boss though, again, I'd have to say the same thing about the Silent Hill games. So, you know, it's fine. Lost in Vivo is heavily inspired by Silent Hill, something which is apparent from the jump. All of Kira's games are clearly heavily influenced by retro horror experiences, games from the PS1 and N64 era especially. On the itch.io page for Lost in Vivo, and many of Kira's other games, you can find box art renders for the game, imagining, for example, Lost in Vivo as a PS1 game. Although Lost in Vivo is clearly trying to be a PS1 game, and is heavily inspired by Silent Hill, the game it ultimately ends up reminding me the most of in the franchise is actually the PS2's Silent Hill 3. That's deliberate, I think. If you play the game's hidden dark mode, which we'll talk about in a bit, you can even see a direct reference to the mascot character that debuted in Silent Hill 3, Robbie the Rabbit. The rust-covered sewers, and especially the subway tunnels you end up spending a lot of time in at the beginning of Lost in Vivo, might as well be pulled directly from the early hours of Silent Hill 3. 
Lost in Vivo is heavily Silent Hill inspired, but it also knows you've probably played those games before, and it's playing with your expectations. Like I said, an early section of the game is set in a subway station, which is extremely reminiscent of the subway station from the beginning of Silent Hill 3. There's a really famous bit in Silent Hill 3 where you end up on the subway tracks when all of a sudden you hear a train start approaching you. If you're not quick, then Heather will be pancaked. Any player that's even remotely genre-savvy is going to be expecting something similar to happen in Lost in Vivo, during a section that takes you walking the tracks with derelict subway cars. Of course, a few seconds later, this happens. You have to walk down one way to a dead end before the train car turns on and starts barreling towards you. As you dodge out of the way, though... It's some sort of terrifying train demon that begins chasing you. This is one of my favorite scares in the entire game. Not to mention one of my favorite monster designs. The whole game is full of creative moments like this. Ones which play with your expectations of what will happen in a standard horror game in order to mess with your head. I don't want to spoil all of these, but they often involve interface screws as well. One of my favorites is when you reach a save room and quickly interact with the save point, only for the game to flash save deleted instead of the normal game saved text. Interacting with the save point further doesn't do anything, so you step back outside, only to be immediately faced with an unwinnable boss fight that instantly kills you, and the game starts over. Of course, this is all a fake-out, and you haven't really lost progress. It's not surprising when the game reveals the fake-out, but it's also nerve-wracking when the game says your save has been deleted. Even if you're fully expecting the reveal, it still makes things tense for a few minutes. Another great scare, which occurs at the very start of the game, is very easily missable. In the sewer tunnels at the start of the game, you're able to whistle, which causes your dog, Danny, to bark back at you. You're meant to use this to navigate the maze of sewer tunnels to find out what direction your dog is in. After a few moments, though, when you whistle, Danny's bark is replaced by an eerie, inhuman-sounding whistle calling back to you. It's a really terrifying moment, and if you're not spamming the whistle button, it's easy to miss. I didn't encounter it until my third playthrough, myself. The sound design is one of Lost in Vivo's greatest strengths. Everything in this game just sounds unpleasant. Sound design is so important to effective horror, and Lost in Vivos genuinely stands alongside the greats like Silent Hill. Silent Hill comparisons for horror games are pretty common, but truly, I think Lost in Vivo is one of the few games that really deserves that comparison. It really nails what makes the first three Silent Hill games such classics while standing all on its own. Everything in the Silent Hill games is dripping with symbolism. Every enemy you encounter is symbolic of some deeper fear or trauma which the characters have. Something I think often gets lost in the shuffle when talking about Silent Hill, though, is that you don't need to engage with that symbolism in order for the Silent Hill games to work. I'm not saying you shouldn't engage with the symbolism, or trying to give some empty, the door is red style anti-critique. What I'm pointing out is that Silent Hill still works as a purely effective horror game on a first playthrough before you have the context for what's going on. When you see scary nurses, you don't need to know that's a representation of James's repressed sexual urges in order to find the scary nurses scary. Then, when you come back to the experience, either by replaying or simply going over it again in your mind, these symbolic elements solidify the themes of the game in your mind. 
great horror needs to operate on both levels, and Lost in Vivo absolutely does. I think it's easily Kira's scariest game on a purely visceral level, but it also contains those symbolic elements that make the story stick with you. Lost in Vivo is a game about anxiety and facing your fears. A question which Lost in Vivo begs constantly is how literal are the events happening in the game? I think it's a question without any answer, to be clear, but it is one which the game wants you to be asking. Even the way the game is described in outside sources is disconnected, confusing. As an example, the Steam page essentially has two descriptions, one given as a graphic and one as the actual text. And if you read them both, it's like they're describing two different games. The first description reads like this. You can feel it everywhere you go. The walls getting closer, the sky dropping further down every day. With each labored breath, your world is shrinking. Like a snake constricting its prey, or several layers of cellophane wrapped around someone's mouth. You can't scream, and you can't breathe. You feel like this several times a day. Sometimes, suddenly, other times, it builds in the back of your mind. You sought a way out. You sought help. But the therapy your doctor prescribes involves confronting your fears, something that you have dreadfully avoided until now. Then, the second description, immediately following it, reads like this. A horror game about claustrophobia. During a storm, your service dog is forced down a broken sewer drain. You find the nearest sewer entrance and run in after it. Along the way, you will meet others that are also stricken by abnormal or psychological fear. You may be able to help them, just as you may be able to free yourself. But just as likely, they, and you, may be beyond help. The game begins with a text crawl with the character talking to their therapist, who says they must begin in vivo therapy, and then immediately shows the cutscene with Danny being swept away during a storm. Even your dog is notably a service dog, an emotional support animal for the main character, Larry the Cucumber, who is dealing with crippling anxiety and depression. We know that because we later get the information that the therapist is prescribing our main character fluoxetine, which is used to treat depression and anxiety disorders. As you progress through the game, you start losing time. The game hard cuts several times from one area to the next, and the layout of the world makes no logical sense. You go down, 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 deep underground, only to end up in a subway station with stairs leading directly to the outside world. At the end, after all the descending you've done, you leave the underground world via a ladder no longer than the one you used to get into the sewers at the very beginning. The game's name, Lost in Vivo, refers to in vivo therapy. Now, I'm not a therapist, so I don't claim to have a super detailed knowledge on this subject, but my understanding from research is that in vivo therapy is also called exposure therapy. It is, literally, a form of therapy that involves slowly exposing patients to subjects that are connected to their trauma or their fears. It's easy then to just wave your hands and say, oh, this is all just the main character's therapy sessions. Nothing is literal. But, like, no. In vivo therapy isn't hypnosis. They don't put you into a dream state where you see all your fears. It's more like directly talking about traumatic events which are uncomfortable for the patient to discuss. Not to mention, the secret ending, which we'll talk about in a moment, directly leads into Lunacid, and is related to Uctena 64 and Spookies. So does all of Lunacid, Spookies, and Uctena 64 also take place inside of Larry the Cucumber's head? Maybe, but at what point does that stop being a meaningful statement and just devolve into Ash Ketchum Coma Theory style nonsense? So are the events of the game literal? Is this not literally the patient's therapy, but a form of in vivo exposure where they're forced to confront their fears in order to save their dog? I'm more sympathetic to this reading, but it doesn't fully work either. The loss of time and these monologues from your own brain at the end of the game. 
The map for one area of the game is even printed inside of a brain scan. Like I said, this ambiguity is deliberate. A reading where the game takes place all in the protagonist's head doesn't work. A reading where the game is completely literal also doesn't work. There doesn't need to be a strict answer, and trying to find one is just going to inevitably hit a dead end. Questioning what is real and what isn't is part of the point. It's part of the effect the game is going for. Another avenue for analysis are the references to Dante's Inferno, contained within the game. The game is heavily inspired by the epic poem. Most notably, as the character descends into the sewers, just before things really start to pop off, you can see some graffiti playing off of the Abandon all hope ye who enter here inscribed on the gates of hell in Inferno. There's also a mysterious character guiding you through the game who is responsible for many of the terrible situations you find yourself in, and who is named Virgil, which is, of course, a reference to the character of Toland from Destiny 2. I shall be your Virgil once again. No, I'm just kidding. It's a reference to the depiction of Virgil from Dante's Inferno, who guides Dante through hell, obviously. I've seen some very literal interpretations that this means that Lost in Vivo is just an adaptation of Dante's Inferno, like it were that 2010 character action game from EA, but also no, there aren't enough levels for that, first of all. They don't follow the layers of hell, either. The subway section, for example, is about self-image and eating disorders, telling through its notes the story of a woman in an abusive relationship with someone who is constantly belittling her weight. All of the posters hanging on the wall are about food or about weight loss. This isn't a section of the game about the gluttony circle of hell, it's the opposite. It's a woman struggling to force herself to eat at all. Lost in Vivo is a game about anxiety, and the literary allusions, to me, speak to the way anxiety and trying to dig yourself out of it can feel like a descent into hell. I live with a pretty severe anxiety disorder myself. I've been upfront about that on this channel, so a lot of the sentiments here, I really relate to them. Lost in Vivo has a lot to say about fear and how we let it control us. Body image, feeling bad about yourself, letting what others think control you, paranoia, being convinced that your friends secretly hate you and are talking about you behind your back, even mania, the way severe anxiety can be used to propel yourself forward, but often in a self-destructive way. It also, though, has a lot to say about how important horror media is, because of how we can use horror to control our fears. Near the end of the game, a brain talks to you. Your brain, presumably. It says this. What are you hoping to accomplish? Without me, you're just hollow. You're pathetic. You need fear to motivate you. Do you think you're getting better? Does doing this even have a purpose? I'm your identity. I'm your crutch. You used to cling to me like a parasite. I know you better than anyone, and I know you're weak. You'll come right back. These lines hit me so hard. They're what makes me think the writing in this game is really something special. It's your fear talking to you. Your anxiety, your mental illness whatever you want to call it. It's something I relate to. The feeling that anxiety, fear, is such a part of you that maybe it is you, the very core of what you are. There can be a real reluctance to try to get better, to try to move on from fear, because you're not sure what else you are if you aren't afraid. You've been afraid for so long. What if there's nothing else inside of you? What if you're incapable of feeling good? What if you just don't have it in you? That's not something you see represented in media very often. It's personal, and it's ugly, and it's real. Lost in Vivo is about confronting your fears, and ultimately is about confronting the fear of living without overbearing anxiety. If you've never had this experience, I'm not sure how it'll sound to you. It's something I've had to go through myself, on my own path through life, and it can often feel like it's something no one else understands. I recognize this. 
No, I feel like this game recognized me, and I'm so grateful for that. I think it's interesting that most people I know who love horror also struggle with anxiety, myself included. I'm not saying it's everyone who loves horror, obviously, but there is something about horror that I've always been drawn to, and I think it's directly tied to the anxiety I face in everyday life. Horror media is an exaggerated version of our fears. It can be something as broad as Night of the Living Dead representing fears of rampant consumerism gone mad, or something as personal as Hereditary's fears of the sickness, both mental and physical, we silently carry in our genes. Horror media gives us a way to confront our fears, confront the ugliness of the world in a safe, digestible way. I think that's why kids are often really drawn to horror media. We don't talk about it much, but kids love being scared in a safe environment. That's why the creepy cute aesthetic is a thing. That's why children's horror media like Goosebumps or Gravity Falls is so popular. No matter your age though, I think being able to confront what scares you in a way that's safe is important. As an example, in the spring of 2020, when the pandemic was at its peak, I played the Resident Evil 3 remake, set during the fall of Raccoon City from its own pandemic. It was... cathartic. Playing that game, set in a world that at the time felt about five minutes into the future, it helped me cope with a scary situation. It was my own exposure therapy, able to safely, on my own terms, confront the things that scared me. Without that, I don't know where I'd be, truly. Not just Resident Evil 3 Remake, but horror media in general. The way horror is where we let ourselves get lost in vivo. Hey, that's the name of the show. Okay, on a lighter note, let's talk about the game's secret ending, which is going to end up being a linchpin of the entire shared Kira horror game universe. Kira's main games, which I'm defining as Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion, Lost in Vivo, Uctena 64, and Lunacid are all connected, primarily by the cosmic horror entity Biagototh, a great old one. Biagototh is first named in this game and retroactively connected to Specimen 8 from Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion. Biagototh is a Lovecraftian entity that appears physically at the end of Lost in Vivo as this warped tree with a tendril sticking out from it. Biagototh is often depicted as being connected to tree imagery, sticks and bark, as well as meat. Lost in Vivo's secret ending is all about Biagototh, and specifically about unleashing Biagototh on the world. It's pretty obscure to trigger it, but Essentially, what you have to do, if I understand correctly, is first, in the Nizumi Labs section, interact with this corpse until the game freaks out. The game is imitating a Unity Engine error here, but it's not actually an error, it's fake. If you do this, then later on, when you're about to confront the boss of the area, Satyrus, this dead scientist will be forcibly ejected from your inventory, which gives you a little extra jump scare as the dead body then runs away from you a moment later towards Satyrus. Later on, after you fight the final boss of the game, the Siren, if you leave and then immediately return to the Siren's area, you're able to pick up a skull, which you can then bring to Biagototh right before the end of the game and offer it to the outstretched Tendril. Doing this will unleash Biagototh upon the world, which causes a nightmarish apocalypse you discover upon returning to the surface. This is referred to as the Nightmare End. Although this is an ending, one completely disconnected from the main events of the game, and it is an easter egg, I really have to talk about it here, because this ending is the setup for Kira's follow-up game, Lunacid. That game seems to be set in the aftermath, the world that is created by Biagototh being woken up. It's like how the Nier series is a direct sequel to the bad ending of Drakengard. On its own, this easter egg is really neat, but in the context of using it to tie a bunch of completely different and unique games together through this shared great old one, I think it's an extremely cool idea. Kira is making their own shared universe over here like Stephen King did, and 
I'm a sucker for it. Once you've completed Lost in Vivo, you unlock a New Game Plus mode, which allows you to play through the whole game again with all the weapons unlocked. Not just satisfied with this being a victory lap though, Lost in Vivo does the good thing I want all New Game Plus modes to do, it actually changes the game. It's not overwhelmingly different, but not only is New Game Plus mode significantly harder with more enemies appearing and taking a lot more hits before dying, but it's also got some completely new scares. One of my favorites is how a new enemy type can actually spawn inside of save rooms at random when you enter them, which definitely got me good the first time it happened. Once you've beaten New Game Plus mode, you can move on to New Game Plus 2, New Game Plus 3, and so on. More importantly though, you actually unlock an enemy randomizer by beating New Game Plus, which I haven't really messed with, but which I could see adding a ton of replayability. Even though we're now done talking about the main game of Lost in Vivo, we're not even close to being done talking about the package overall. As I said before, one of the key characteristics of Kira's work is a tremendous amount of hidden content. No game is a better example of that than Lost in Vivo. So now, let's talk about all of the hidden bonus modes and extras included in this game. The most interesting of Lost in Vivo's bonus modes is the Midnight Mode. This is actually hinted at in the game proper, where you can find a PS1 disc for a game called Midnight. In order to unlock Midnight Mode, you need to actually launch the game between 12 and 1 AM, or at least change your system clock to those hours. Thankfully, once you've unlocked Midnight Mode, you don't need to continue launching the game between those hours. The mode is added to the Extras menu where you can launch it directly whenever you want. Midnight Mode is Lost in Vivo's answer to something like Resident Evil's Mercenaries Mode, replacing the normal slow pace and systematic approach required for the main game and offering an arcadey combat experience against unique monsters not found in the main game. The mode is also entirely melee combat focused and themed differently from the main game, set in a large castle environment. It's not going to offer quite as much replayability as a good RE Mercenaries mode does, but you can get some good fun out of it. There's even two bosses, one of which is by a Gototh, the cosmic horror entity you unleash in the main game's secret ending. The game spawns you into a castle, gives you a sword, and tells you to collect 30 pieces of silver. A reference to the 30 pieces of silver which Judas Iscariot was paid to betray Jesus Christ according to the Christian Gospels. Each piece of silver is guarded by an enemy, and so you must go track down the 30 enemies stalking the castle and kill them. In order to prevent this from becoming tedious or annoying, you still have an indicator at the top of your screen which always points to the nearest enemy. This still isn't perfect because it doesn't point up and down, only on the X and Z axes, so you can still be confused by being on the wrong level of the castle, but without this, Midnight Mode would suck. It would be an extremely tedious game of hide and seek, and this is a very elegant way of preventing that. There's also a bell which you can ring that will call all of the remaining enemies to you at once if you've only got a few left and don't want to go chase them down. Midnight Mode is inspired by retro From Software titles like Kingsfield and Shadow Tower, and importantly, it is the spiritual predecessor to Lunacid, Kira's next full game, which we'll talk about more in a bit. That said, despite the influence, actually playing Midnight Mode feels more like a boomer shooter to me. Another connection between Midnight Mode and Lunacid is a portrait of this character, Demi, who ends up being a major NPC in Lunacid. I will say, a minor quibble I have with both this game and Lunacid is that this character design never really felt like it fit with the world. I have nothing against an anime aesthetic. I love anime, but nothing else in Lost in Vivo or Lunacid has this sort of exaggerated character design. If this character existed in Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion, I would have absolutely no problem with it, but here it just feels a little bit inconsistent. For what it is, which is a bonus feature and not the main event, Midnight Mode is really good. I really like Midnight Mode. If you have played Lost in Vivo and didn't know this mode existed, you should definitely go give it a try. There are two more hidden modes in Lost in Vivo, the Gallery of Light and Dark Mode. 
These are essentially unlocked the same way by moving the gamma slider all the way in one direction or the other and then starting a new game. If the gamma is set to maximum, you unlock the Gallery of Light, while having it at the minimum possible level unlocks Dark Mode. The Gallery of Light is going to be quicker to talk about. It's just a little model viewer, set up like a museum, which lets you get a good clear view of all of the enemies from the game, including Midnight Mode. I love seeing games include things like this. It reminds me a lot of the museum area, which was included in the Bioshock remaster, but there's not much more to say than that. Dark Mode is a more substantial piece of content. This is essentially an experimental game, like something Kira would release on Itch.io, but bundled into Lost in Vivo instead. Game might be strong, actually. I think it's better described as an interactive music video EP. It takes around 20 minutes to complete. You are in a car, driving down a highway as dusk turns to night, on your way home. The music changes as the area you're driving through does, and it feels like it's emulating the experience of having a dissociative episode while driving late at night, which is a very specific but very interesting thing to depict in a game. This is a good time to talk about the music in these games. It's made by both Kira and frequent collaborator Jaron Christ, and it's all excellent. Talking about music is not my strong suit, because I don't have a musical bone in my body, so I'm not really one to give an in-depth critique of where a piece succeeds or fails, beyond being able to say that it fits the tone the game is going for, or doesn't, or that I like it or not. That said, I think the soundtrack of all of these games succeeds at hitting very specific feelings, and a broad range at that. Dark Mode is an excellent example of how music can be used to set a mood, and how a specific mood can be visualized. Driving down a highway road in the middle of the night, the only light for miles being your headlights, is such a specific feeling. Dark Mode nails it. That is impressive. Both Akamakira and Jaren Christ can be found on Spotify, where you can find both the music from these games and entirely unrelated tracks. Go check out both artists, they're worth your time. Another mode, mostly disconnected from the main game though contained within it, are the Lost Tapes, and the free DLC for Lost in Vivo, the Merces Tapes. As you explore the main game, you can find four cassette tapes scattered throughout the levels. Each of these can then be taken to tape recorders outside of save rooms to play through short horror scenarios. These are all extremely short, they'll probably take you less than 10 minutes apiece, and are only loosely connected to the main story of the game. Lost Tape 1 is set at a dog pound, Lost Tape 2 is set at a clinic, Lost Tape 3 is set in a cabin, and Lost Tape 4 is set at a hotel. Lost Tape 3 is interesting because it directly connects back to Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion, specifically to Specimen 8, the forest deity who would chase you, and was often accompanied by evil flesh-eating deer. Not only does Specimen 8 physically appear in an easter egg here, but this cabin is later called back to in The Dollhouse should you choose to be chased by Specimen 8 to get the good ending. The dollhouse also retroactively tells you that Specimen 8 is connected to Biagototh, some kind of disciple of it called one of its children, to retcon that game into the shared Kira universe. Ultimately, you end Tape 3 by burning an idol of Biagototh before the tape ends. Lost Tapes 1 and 2, I have basically nothing to say about. You walk through them, there's spooky imagery, they're good. There's not really much to them, though. Lost Tape 4 is probably my favorite of the four original ones. It's a bit more involved than the first two. It has you wandering through an abandoned motel, trying to find a place to sleep. Each time you find a clean place to rest your head, it is corrupted while you sleep, ultimately implying that you are the corrupting force, your body actively rotting away as you wander the motel. You are the monster, basically. It's good. I like this one. The Merces tapes were originally planned as an update to the game, which would add five more Lost Tape-style short horror experiences to the game, but only two of these were ever released. The remaining three now read Cancelled in the menu, as Kira has moved on to other projects. That's a shame, because the two tapes we did get are probably the best of the whole bunch. 
First up, Lost Tape 5 serves as a direct follow-up to Lost Tape 3, returning to the cabin and giving us a bit more Biagototh lore. This also names the area the cabin exists in, Wolf Hollow, which will appear again in another Kira game we'll talk about in a moment, Uktena 64. Wolf Hollow is stalked by a giant wolf, another of Biagototh's children. You are trying to escape Wolf Hollow, but end up being attacked by the wolf, which strands you at the cabin from tape 3. The final tape, tape 6, is notably the only tape of the entire bunch which wasn't made by Kira. In the description of the tape, it credits Mr. Craven with the creation of this tape. No disrespect, but, uh... I, I don't know who that is, but some googling has informed me that it's a YouTuber, and that the dog from the main game, Danny, is based on his corgi. So there you go. Tape 6 is pretty good. It features a character trapped in a prison cell along with representations of the seven deadly sins, and then has the player going through various doors to see the final moments of several different people. Again, I don't really have a whole lot to add to this one without just beat by beat telling you what happens in it, so yeah, go play it. It's good. Oh, and also, there's a backrooms easter egg, so that's fun. And that, generally speaking, is Lost in Vivo. It's a phenomenal game. Not only is the main game excellent, but New Game Plus and the random enemy modifiers, along with the various pretty substantial bonus modes, really means you get a lot of bang for your buck here. The fact that a game with this much content costs $12 full price is honestly kind of insane. If any of this sounded interesting to you, I implore you to play the game yourself. Even if you've already seen lore videos about the game, even if you've already watched other people play through it, I think this is a game 100% worth playing through yourself. I've played through it three times, I've seen all the endings, I've gotten all of the achievements. It's one of the best indie horror experiences of the past decade. If you like horror games, you absolutely should play it. Kira's third major release is Lunacid, but before we move on to talking about that, I want to talk about all of their smaller releases. Kira has made two contributions to the Dreadx series, a horror anthology series which began in 2020 as an outlet for indie horror developers to release small projects created during the pandemic, which has gone on to release five collections over the course of 2020 through 2022. It also launched the publisher Dread XP, which has released well-regarded games like My Friendly Neighborhood, Dread Delusion, or Sucker for Love. Kira's first contribution to the anthology series actually isn't one of the games, it's what they call the interactive launcher for the Dread X Collection 3. Essentially, the Dread X Collection 3 contains a meta story and an explorable castle lobby, which serves as the connective tissue between the games and the collection. In order to play the games in the collection, you have to explore the castle to find candles, which can be placed in front of gravestones representing each game in order to unlock them. Playing games opens more areas of the castle, which provides more candles, letting you play more games. Completing all of the games lets you see the end of the meta story. This interactive launcher is cool, it's well made, and it's got some secrets and easter eggs to find. It's not really a full game on its own though, and it isn't meant to be. It serves its purpose as connective tissue between the other titles well. What we're really here to talk about is Kira's contribution to the next game in the series, Dread X Collection The Hunt, where they provided one of the actual games on offer, Uktena 64. Where Lost in Vivo is reminiscent of PS1 horror, Uktena 64 is instead stylized specifically as a Nintendo 64 game, as the title of the game implies. Uktena 64 is about a good-natured hillbilly named Jeb, who is forced to take a job hunting infected wildlife for the CDC after his YouTube channel is demonetized. You got much else going on? Nah, uh, you're right. My channel got demonetized anyway. Too few impressions. Seems impressive enough for me. He's recruited for this job by his friend, who received a very legitimate letter which reads, From CDC. Bad viruses make animal species go bad, we give happy money for proof they dead. This is real. We are the CDC in this emergency. Don't die unless done, no money if you die. Love, Center Disease Center. So yeah, if you hadn't caught on yet, we're firmly back in horror comedy territory. 
The game plays both as a shooter and a photography simulator. A mysterious illness is corrupting wildlife, and you need to kill the infected creatures, and then take photos of them to prove the job is done. The wildlife starts off overly aggressive, but otherwise normal, but becomes increasingly terrifying. These turkeys, for example, have all grown together in a horrifying way. The comedy of this is just so good. This is such a well-observed parody of actual N64 games in tone. So much of this game is legitimately laugh out loud funny, starting right when you get control of your character, where you have to find your camera, which Jeb has apparently left in one of the barrels outside his house. Oh, I think my camera's in one of them barrels. It's just mwah, so good. That's exactly the kind of thing that would happen in an N64 game all the time without kids ever questioning it. The complete lack of self-awareness as Jeb is taking pictures of absolute nightmares and gore and just shouts out, nice shot. It's so good. Listen to the line that plays when you die. Jeb is also a really likable protagonist from what we get to see of him. I like when horror media subverts the common portrayal of rednecks as insane serial killers. Stuff like Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, for example. This reminds me a lot of that movie, actually. The game is only about an hour long, but there are also multiple difficulty settings and a bunch of hidden cheat codes to enter to mess with your experience. One of these cheat codes, for example, turns all of the animals into humanoid monsters instead. Ostensibly, this is for people who have an issue playing games that depict harm towards animals, but it also makes the game way harder and way scarier. This is easily my favorite game included in the fourth DreadX collection. It's one of the best projects to come out of that anthology series overall. Though the game is short, I think it's funny, scary, and just plain fun enough to justify the DreadX collection, the hunt's $10 price tag all on its own. I have a real soft spot for N64 games. The N64 was the first console I had in my home, getting it just shortly after getting my Game Boy Color as a kid. So seeing a game that so perfectly captures the unique spirit and energy that N64 games had makes me ridiculously happy. I love the idea of making a photography game, since one of the most iconic N64 games is still Pokemon Snap. It's not the first thing I'd think of if I were trying to make an N64-inspired game, but it is extremely recognizable and feels authentic. This game is very directly connected to Kira's shared universe. It's actually where we get most of the lore we know about Biogototh in general, albeit indirectly. The game is set in Wolf Hollow, like Lost in Vivo's Lost Tapes 3 and 5. The name Biagototh isn't directly said in the game proper, so the connections might be easy to miss, but the hardest difficulty setting is called Biakin. And of course, the setting of Wolf Hollow was very important to the backstory for Specimen 8 from Spookies and Biagototh in general in Lost Tapes 3 and 5. The most direct lore we get out of Uctena is actually very hidden because it doesn't come from the game itself. The game credits its soundtrack in part to the fictional band Ritual Wails to the Cosmic Tree, who are actually also credited on the Lost in Vivo soundtrack. If you look up Ritual Wails to the Cosmic Tree, you can find the EP which they allegedly made for Uctena 64 on Bandcamp, Salix Babylonica. And if you look at the info about the songs, you get a massive lore dump about Biagototh and its children. In the order the songs appear on the EP, these descriptions read as follows. Fire. A fire within the forest caused the great seed to split, and it gave forth tiny green seeds which were taken and planted. Eventually, the roots of each reunited with the one great seed, and Biagototh became. Wolf. The wolf was not a willing follower of Baia, but was instead a sacrifice by the others. Although eventually they were found and raised by humans, the seed of Baia's flesh grew within the wolf, and they became drawn to violence. Stolen from and given flesh, found in Wolf Hollow as a child, given flesh from the holy tree, stolen child of Baia Gototh, Black Wolf of Midnight, given flesh from the holy tree, 
Black Wolf of Midnight stalks his prey, innocent youth on all display, tearing teeth and glowing eyes, moonlit night with howling cries. Corvus, the crow, eater of the dead, the half-dead offspring of Biagototh and the corpse of a hanged man. They circle dying things and perform necromancy by eating and vomiting spores into the carrion. Uctena. One tiny seed was ingested by an Uctena, and within the great snake it grew tremendously. Formless space seed rooted in the earth, born from the wound of Azathoth, grows and twists under the tree, is the being Biagototh. Tiny insects of the world cower, scream, and bleed, bow before Biagototh, devourer of need. Bow before the tree, tiny insects of the world. You cannot resist the change. Rar. Chiroptera. The bat or bats are another of Baya's spawn. They collect and spread blood. Some of Baya's followers become living trees, which are then fed on by the bats, who then bring the blood into deep caves to nourish Biagototh's roots. In a cave beyond the trees, the need for blood has come. The wind given teeth give your blood to them. The need for blood. Strix Varia. The owl, the discarded child of Baia, endlessly flies through the night looking for a way to reverse the change and reclaim their mortality. Why do I try? I'd rather die. Why do I try? I'd rather die. Everything turns out the same in the end. This is the most direct storytelling we ever get about Baia Gototh, and it's hidden in the album notes of a fictional band's Bandcamp page. The song Uctena's description is especially interesting, because it applies what is happening in Uctena 64 is actually the origin of Biagototh. That it was a fragment which split off of Azathoth, who is the central deity in Lovecraft's mythos from which everything else spreads, which was ingested by the great serpent Uctena, which serves as the final boss of Uctena 64, and was first born from the great snake when you kill it at the end of the game, and then presumably fully empowered by the sacrifice made at the end of Lost in Vivo. I think that also means Uctena 64 is the earliest game on the Kira shared universe timeline, for whatever that's worth. Uctena 64 is another absolutely perfect game from this creator. No notes. It's extremely funny, it plays well, it's got some very legit scares, and the story and connective tissue between Kira's games is all interesting and provocative. If you've missed this one, I highly recommend checking it out. But hey, you didn't just come here to hear me talk about products you can buy on Steam, did you? No, you want that weird stuff. Everyone knows about Spooky South of Jump Scares. Lost in Vivo has 2600 Steam reviews. That's way too mainstream. You want to hear about the deep cuts in Akuma Kira's catalog. The things you can only find on Akuma Kira's Ichio. The things you can only find on Akumakira's Game Jolt. I got you. I'm gonna lightning round through these because a lot of them are very slight, 10-15 to 15 minutes long total. I know I gave a disclaimer at the beginning, but I feel like reiterating it here. Most of these are built around a single twist, so by talking about them, I'm kind of giving away why you would want to play them. I will be linking to every game I talk about in this video in the description below. All of the games in this section are free, with the exception of Basilisk 2000, which costs an entire $2. So if you don't want them spoiled before playing them yourself, skip Minecraft, Sin, and Virgilius. You're good. You can pass on them. Corpse Ocean is good. Basilisk 2000 is great. Don't sleep on either. Now you can jump ahead to the Lunacid section. The video will be broken into chapters below. I also don't think any of these have direct lore connections to Kira's main games. I didn't catch any Biagototh references in any of them, so they're all pretty much standalone, except for Basilisk getting a direct sequel with Basilisk 2000. Now, in no particular order, let's talk about a bunch of games. Space Blaster, or Lines, is a cool game. This was released on May 2nd, 2014 on Akuma Kira's Game Jolt page. The idea with this game, which is an idea Kira will revisit several times, is that you're playing an unreleased and unfinished project, a game called Space Blaster. 
The gimmick is that the game is haunted by some sort of presence that keeps messing with you and adds files to your computer as you play. Files which reveal a short story about a family that was seemingly killed by whatever the presence inside of this game is. This is an idea we've seen quite a few times in indie horror games now, but this predates, for example, Doki Doki Literature Club by several years, so it's pretty impressive. It's very short, but I think this is the first project publicly released by Kira, and so it's interesting to see just how strong and creative their vision was right from the start. It's too bad it ends by redirecting you to a dead link, and I can't find what the original video file it directed you to was. The ideas here will later be much better executed in Basilisk and its sequel, Basilisk 2000, so this is really only noteworthy as a curiosity in Kira's oeuvre, but I'm glad I found it. I would recommend just playing Basilisk and Basilisk 2000 instead, though, now that those exist. Minercraft has the unique honor of being the only game in this entire video I actively dislike. This game is just... it's nothing. It was released on May 9th, 2014, one week after Lines. It's a joke game. It looks like it's going to be a Minecraft clone, but it's actually a grotesque horror game where you're doing crafts that devolve into things like draw the tattoo or amputate the hand. This was probably a pretty funny joke in 2014, but now we live in a post-Elsagate world? I am desensitized to disturbing horror games masquerading as a rip-off app targeted to dumb kids. Although, Actually, I mean it was 2014, Minecraft had been on console for well over two years by this point, so I feel like the age of low-effort Minecraft clones this is parodying had pretty much passed by then. Also, I couldn't get past the amputate the hand step. I don't know if there is anything past that step. I don't want to harp on this, it's clearly something Kira threw together very quickly, I just didn't like it. It's also from almost ten years ago. Moving on. College Slam is another joke game, but this time I think the joke is actually very funny. You look at it and it seems like it's going to be a basketball game. You start it, nothing happens for the first few seconds, then a basketball monster bursts through the side of the screen and starts chasing you. The game is a runner. As you go on, the obstacles you're dodging get increasingly absurd. Man, what is it that's so funny about basketball games? This reminds me a lot of Charles Barkley's Shut Up and Jam Gaiden. Anyway, this is pretty standard game jam fare. Go play it. It's free on Kira's Itch.io. It'll only take you like 20 minutes to complete. Sin is a reimagining of the arcade game Sinistar. It's also the only game in this entire video I wasn't able to finish. Well, maybe Minecraft. I don't know if there's more of that game or not. The trick to Sin is that it's actually impossible to complete unless you enter a code, which can be found on the game box render on the game's Itch.io page. I could not get the code to work. I even looked up footage of someone else entering the code to make sure I was doing it right. It just didn't work. The thing that it's supposed to do did not happen. I recuse myself from evaluating this game because of it, but I'm going to mention it anyway for completion's sake. Virgilius, or Versilius, the actual application is called Versilius, but everything else says Virgilius, is... Well, there's really nothing to it. I'm completely neutral on this one. You are a guy who has died, who is wandering in hell. Hell is a blasted wasteland, devoid of any life. After a few minutes, you see some towers, go to them, find a sword, and cut your head off. The end. There's no gameplay to speak of, or even really story. It's closer to an interactive poem than it is a game. Also, a game that's about someone spending eternity in hell and the horrors of what eternity actually means, but also it's over in like 15 minutes, it just doesn't work. While I was working on this script, the Exploring series released his video on SCP-7179, E is for Eternity, so I couldn't help but draw some comparisons between the two in my own mind. You should go read that article or watch his video. It hits some similar themes, but is actually really disturbing and scary, where I don't think Virgilius is much of anything. I really just think this was a graphics test that got published to Kira's site. That sounds damning, but it's also a freeware thing. You have to dig pretty deep into Kira's work to even find. So, I mean, it's fine. It's neat. It's one of those games in the screensaver genre. I wouldn't really recommend it to anyone. We're going to talk about another game in a moment that does the same thing, but better in every way. Corpse Ocean. Now we're in the good stuff. 
The rest of these projects I've yet to talk about are all worth your time. Corpse Ocean is awesome. It's a horror submarine simulator. You're the pilot of a submarine who is tasked with recovering some barrels containing biologically hazardous materials. The game is about learning how to control the submarine through the controls in front of you, and how to read your navigational equipment to reach the locations provided. As you go, increasingly spooky things start to happen. Of course, this is very similar to Iron Lung in concept. The biggest difference is in Corpse Ocean, you can actually see out of your submarine. You aren't purely navigating based on your equipment. It also came out a year before Iron Lung did, lest anyone call it a ripoff. This was a game jam project for Dread X's Dredge the Depths game jam, so it's still pretty short. You can do the whole thing in about a half an hour, but it's also free. If you like Iron Lung, I really recommend sitting down to play this game. It's well worth your time. It's like an alternate take on a similar concept, and it's got some good scares in it. Plus, learning to control the submarine is really satisfying. The Undying Beast is like Virgilius, but good, which is funny because The Undying Beast came out first. It's about the same length, but just leans much more into Kira's strengths. It has a much more retro PS1 aesthetic, and the writing feels like a proper rumination on death and acceptance of mortality, rather than just kind of existing. It's so short, I really can't add that much to it without just showing you the whole game. It's like 10 minutes long. This one's good though. I quite like it. You should go play it. Also, one of the models from Lost in Vivo reappears here. That's neat. Now for the main event of this lightning round section. Basilisk and Basilisk 2000. Of all of the projects I hadn't yet played when I started this video, which is to say pretty much everything in this lightning round section, Basilisk and its sequel, Basilisk 2000, are the ones that justified making this entire project. You should play Basilisk. You must play Basilisk 2000. Basilisk SNES was released on February 2nd, 2022. Both games in the series are stylized as unfinished older projects, which someone has found somehow and has released for preservation purposes. They're tapping into the lost media phenomenon. Hey, here's this project no one's seen before. Check it out. What's cool about these, though, is the presentation. Basilisk is presented via a fictional SNES emulator, which you are, supposedly, actually downloading. In order to play Basilisk, you have to load up save states that are included with the download, that let you see bite-sized pieces of this unfinished project. And, of course, because it's a horror game, the implication is that something sinister might be hiding inside of the game. I love the feeling of loading someone else's save states. It reminds me of this very specific feeling you used to get when you'd rent a game or buy a used game at Funko Land. Games used to store saves on the cartridge, not internal memory on the system. So if you bought a used cart, unless someone thought to wipe the data on it, which they never did, you'd be able to see everything the previous person who had played that copy had done. I remember my copy of Ocarina of Time had this save file on it that was right at the end of the game, just before Ganon's Tower. The first time I loaded that save, I hadn't even made it to the adult link section of the game yet. So suddenly loading this other save file and seeing what the endgame looked like blew my mind. Of course, this is what the single most famous video game creepypasta, Ben Drowned, is built around as well. Weird, haunted files on an old game cart. It's a little played at this point, but this is the only time I've seen it used in an actual game, not a non-interactive story format. There's also something very appealing about the sense that you're seeing this whole game beginning to end in these very bite-sized chunks. If you've played the kind of medieval RPG this game is referencing, it feels like you know exactly where these slices of the game would have been, like you're seeing the whole game in Fast Forward. The only problem I have with Basilisk is... it doesn't really look like an SNES game. It's doing things with 3D that the SNES was not capable of, at least, I don't think it was. 3D on the Super Nintendo looked like Star Fox, not Doom. You guys know the game No Players Online? That game drives me kind of crazy because I quite like it even with its story faults, but it alleges the game you're playing is from 1986. No. No, it's not. This is not what video games looked like in 1986. 
If this were a game from 1996, maybe, but 1986, no way. Basilisk is not quite as guilty of this because the Super Nintendo was receiving new games all the way until 1998, so I can suspend my disbelief a bit, but it's borderline. I wish it had been presented as an N64 or PSX game instead. It's a nitpick, but it did bother me, and that's why we're here. The sequel, Basilisk 2000, is awesome. Please play it. The game is criminally underexposed. I found one playthrough of it posted on YouTube when I was doing research for this script. This is an S-tier Kira project. I would put it on the same level as Spookies, Lost in Vivo, Uctena 64, and Lunacid. Disclaimer, this game obscures its contents so heavily, I definitely haven't seen all of it. I think I saw most of the content, but I'm 100% sure there's at least some stuff I haven't seen. And the game is very weird, and it's kind of hard to see everything. Basilisk 2000 was released earlier this year, on March 29th, 2023. It is, much like its predecessor, presented as an unfinished game from yesteryear, a sequel to Basilisk for SNES. In the README file, it's even noted that it's unclear how a game that never came out got a sequel, but it's assumed the original was just cancelled in order to make this game instead. Where the first game was presented through a fake emulator, this is presented through the level editor, which was theoretically being used to make the game. In order to go to different areas, you have to type load followed by the name of the cell into a box, and press enter, which of course, means you need to explore the game, to figure out the names of the cells you can travel to. You can explore the contents of each of these maps, either in god mode or in a walk mode, where you can interact with the game closer to how it would be intended. Of course, much like the first game, there's an eerie implication of something supernatural contained within the game that may be responsible for it never releasing in the first place. The first Basilisk will only take you half an hour or so to comb through, but its sequel has a lot more to see. If you were concerned about getting your money's worth from the $2 price tag, don't be. You can easily lose six or more hours to this game and not have found everything. It's not going to be for everyone, but it's an awesome and really unique experience. The closest thing to this game I can think of is when Adam Butcher dropped all of the assets he used to build Crow 64 for his Whatever Happened to Crow 64 ARG, but there you were actually combing through Unity assets, not this fake game development tool that is actually the game itself. I also need to point out that there's a reference to David Bunch in this game that made me so happy. The fictional director of the game, in universe, is named David Bunch. The very first sign you come across, just a few feet from the start of the game in Kingsfield 4, reads, Shop, David Bunch. It's just a very funny sign, a very funny bit of wording, and a weird name to give someone in a dark fantasy game. There's actually some backstory, though. Kingsfield was so obscure in the West by the time Kingsfield 4 came out that the translation team decided to name a bunch of the characters in 4's translation after a group of fans in a Yahoo group called the Verdite Inn, some of the only people in the English-speaking world who were actively discussing the game online pre-release. One of these fans was the Yahoo group's admin, David Bunch. This is such a hyper-specific reference, it had me cackling when I saw it in the game. Kira clearly has a lot of fondness for the same kind of weird and obscure late 90s and early 2000s games that were very formative for me and my taste in games, as well as, obviously, Kingsfield, which I came to later but I've grown to love, and so it's cool to see someone creating cool horror projects like this. This is not a game with a defined beginning and end, it's definitely one of those how-do-I-know-when-I'm-satisfied types of experiences. If you already knew the level codes for the later areas, there's nothing stopping you from just entering them right at the start. At the same time, the joy of this experience is poking at it and figuring out what there is to find hidden throughout it. It's also, at its heart, intended to be a collaborative experience. I would be very impressed by anyone who found everything in this game without looking anything up or talking to other people, and I don't really think you're meant to. The game's itch.io page even says, Much of this game is hidden and will be hard to discover on your own, along with a link to Kira's Discord server. I want more people to play this game. I want to see the wild stuff that other people find, 
because I found some pretty wild stuff, and I was playing this game all by myself. I want to see a bunch of random YouTube screamers making clickbait thumbnails that say, the scariest game ever made, and this unfinished game is hiding a dark secret, because I want this game to get mainstream recognition. It's really cool and deserves some more eyeballs on it. Finally, that brings us to Lunacid. If I've managed to write, record, and edit this script in just under three weeks, then Lunacid is officially leaving early access and hitting 1.0 today, October 31st, 2023. I've debated how to cover Lunacid in this video because I love it. It's easily my favorite game Kira's ever released, but it also isn't actually finished yet when I'm writing this script. I don't have any sort of early access code for review or anything. I bought into the early access version when it launched because I wanted to support the game. It doesn't make a lot of sense for me to do a big deep dive on the game, what I've played of it that is, when the version I've played will be outdated by the time this video goes live. So this is going to be more abbreviated than the section which talked about either Spookies or Lost in Vivo to serve as a review of my experience with the early portions of the game. I'll only be talking about the game's first two major areas, Hollow Basin and the Fetid Mire, and the game's third area, the Sanguine Sea, which serves as something of a hub for the rest of the game, with multiple areas spanning off from it rather than a fully featured area of its own. I've played several areas past this, to be clear, but I think talking about that early slice of the game should be plenty to explain why it's so special. At some point in the future, after I've had my hands on the full version of Lunacid long enough to really sink my teeth into it, I'll probably do another video about it, more of a full deep dive into the game as a whole. As I said before in the section about Lost in Vivo's Midnight Mode, Lunacid serves as a spiritual successor to Midnight Mode, and is directly inspired by old FromSoft games like Shadow Tower and Kingsfield. I know that because Lunacid's Steam description reads, Lunacid is a first-person dungeon crawler inspired by old FromSoft games, like Shadow Tower and Kingsfield. The retro FromSoft titles are games I've really grown to love over the past few years. Like many people, I hadn't really heard of From Software until they rose to prominence in the West with Demon Souls and then Dark Souls. So much of what makes modern From Software games great, the atmosphere, the world design, the unique monsters, all traces back to the studio's very founding with the Kingsfield games in the 90s. Classic FromSoft games have a really unique appeal, even among the niche that is dungeon crawlers. Their atmosphere and the sense of exploration is unmatched. The only problem is that actually playing them looks like this. The Kingsfield games, and by extension Shadow Tower and Eternal Ring, are slow. Once I got used to them, I ended up growing really fond of that slowness, their rhythm of combat, and finding joy in it, but it's a very big ask for modern players. It can feel like something you'd need unlimited free time to power through long enough to get a feel for it. I myself only managed to actually get into retro FromSoft titles in a real way after trying and bouncing off of the games several times during the early days of the pandemic, specifically the first week of quarantine after watching all three Lord of the Rings extended cuts back to back to back. What I'm saying is you have to be in a very specific headspace to play enough of these games to actually click with them. They're very outdated and weird by modern standards. They come from a time where we were, as people, still figuring out how to control a character in 3D space, and things which now seem obvious hadn't been solidified yet. For example, in order to look up and down, you can't just use the right stick. You have to use the L2 and R2 trigger buttons. In order to turn left and right, you use left and right on the D-pad. For those keeping score, that equates to first-person tank controls, which is just not going to be something a lot of modern players are willing to deal with. All of that is what makes Lunacid so impressive to me. So much of what makes Kingsfield great is tied up with how unique it is. I've played other modern Kingsfield-inspired games, like for example Devilspire, and they're really great, but at the same time, by virtue of modernizing things, they don't quite hold the same appeal. Lunacid 
is not a chore to play. Lunacid feels modern. When you're playing with keyboard and mouse, it has mouse look, as expected. When playing on a controller, you can just use the right stick. It no longer takes 30 full seconds to rotate your character 360 degrees. The game's combat is still slow and methodical by modern gaming standards, but it's not Kingsfield slow. Lunacid plays like a video game. It also, though, feels like Kingsfield down in its very bones. Lunacid gets the tone so, so right. Here, let me play some clips for you real quick. One of the opening cutscene of Kingsfield 4, and another of the opening cutscene of Lunacid. The cursed land lies deep in a dense, colorless forest. Hidden within this land is an ancient city, once known to the forest folk as the Holy Land. Long ago, a great beast came from the sea and brought with it a poisonous fog that spread across the earth. The first time I saw that, I was grinning ear to ear. It's not that the opening cutscene of Lunacid is good, it's that the opening cutscene is bad in such a specific way. It makes it feel like it would have been at home on the PS1, a contemporary with the Kingsfield games, even though actually playing it feels so much more modern. That said, to talk about Lunacid purely in its relation to classic FromSoft games is to sell the game very short. There's a lot here that the game does well on its own terms. Things those classic FromSoft games don't touch on at all. The character creation menu, for example, is surprisingly robust. Your starting class might initially seem like it just changes around your stat distribution, but it's actually much deeper than that. Not only do some of the origins have special features, like undead being more resistant to status effects, or vampires being able to heal through doing damage, but they actually have an impact on the game itself. The best example of this I know of is that the vampire starting class actually gets immediate access to one of the game's later levels, a vampire castle, and it doesn't need to track down a key item to get in. I'm hoping the full game has more clever details like that. You're also able to use your own custom character portraits by dropping a PNG into the correct folder, which is very funny and has a ton of meme build potential. Leveling up allows you to allocate stat points, and these stats not only cover raw damage output, but things like movement speed, jump height, or spellcast time. That means there's a tremendous amount of build variety, whether you want to play as an up-close knight, a spellcaster, or use ranged weaponry to chip enemies away from afar, all seem pretty viable. Even within broad archetypes like spellcaster, you can specialize. For example, using blood magic instead of regular magic. Blood magic spells are cast from your hit points instead of your mana pool, so you could build a heavy tank character with high damage output from blood magic spells. There's a wide selection of weapons you can obtain throughout the game, and in a choice I find very clever, many of them start out underwhelming, but can be evolved if used enough. The torch, for example, is really only useful as a light source at first, but if you keep using it, eventually you're able to upgrade it to the iron torch, which has some actual damage output. I find doing this pretty addictive. I enjoy trying to upgrade every weapon I find when that's possible. All of this makes the game highly replayable. I've been through those initial hours of the game quite a few times at this point, and not only can I now speedrun the early areas by heart, but every time I go through them, my character build, and therefore gameplay, end up looking entirely different. Lunacid is a game where you will get lost. There are times in Lunacid where I have no idea where I'm supposed to be going, or even how to get out of a maze I've somehow found myself at the center of. There's no hand-holding here. At the very beginning of the game, it plops you down in the world with no real idea what your mission is or what direction you should be heading, giving you no choice but to go forward. There's also some immersive sim DNA here, though. The game can often feel a bit overwhelmingly non-linear, where the correct path forward is unclear, but that's because the game is more about presenting the player with challenges they can figure out any number of ways to solve within the game's mechanics. If you need to cross a gap to get to a secret area, then it's not about finding the right key item that lets you bridge the gap, it's about figuring out a way to use the mechanics of the game to do so. That can mean power leveling your speed and dexterity stats until you have a comically long jump like a high level Oblivion character, or, I'm told, I haven't done this myself, it can mean using a magic ring to stack boxes and create a staircase to get across instead. 
Lunacid, like many of Kira's games, is full of secrets. The game initially seems more linear than it actually is, but there are entirely new areas you can visit right from the start that the game doesn't direct you towards. There's tremendous confidence in Lunacid, obscuring huge bits of content so heavily and trusting that if the player wants to find them, they will look for them. There's some really bizarre stuff in this game, too. Take, for example, a spell you can find early on that gives life to inanimate objects. Cast it on a pot in a room, for example, and you'll find it starts screaming and helplessly rolling around on the floor. You've given it life, but that's all you've done. Although Lunacid leans less heavily on the horror aesthetic and more on the dark fantasy side of things, I still consider it to be a horror game. There are a lot of creepy enemy designs and some pretty tense moments. For those who have played the early access version past what I'll be talking about here, I'll just say death approaches. Lunacid is the best playing game of anything we've talked about today. It feels good to move around and to attack. The combat works, and you feel like you have more weight and more presence in the world than you did in something like Lost in Vivo. I love the difficulty curve of the game because, like many retro dungeon crawlers, of course including classic FromSoft titles, it's more of a difficulty sine wave. Every area feels like it starts out really tough, but by the time you've reached the end of it, you feel absurdly overpowered, both due to the levels you've earned from killing enemies and the new equipment you've acquired. At the same time, the build variety means that once you know what you're doing and where you're going, you can absolutely destroy the leveling curve, jumping several areas ahead in power within the game's first hour. I'm hoping a speedrun community ends up forming around the finished game, because I fully believe it's going to be a blast to watch high skill play. That's not to say everything about the game is perfect. I think the alchemy slash crafting system is a confusing mess that I never want to engage with because it just isn't fun to use. Because of that, finding random alchemy material drops from monsters always feels a bit disappointing. I didn't really need this game to have crafting. It feels like a little bit of bloat that should either be expanded into something that feels better to use, or honestly just excised entirely. Not every game needs a crafting system. I also think this key you have to buy for a single silver off of the Merchant and Wings Rest to progress into the rest of Hollow Basin could probably use a better home. Right when Early Access launched, the key cost a lot more than one silver to buy if memory serves, which was incredibly obnoxious because it meant there was an early game roadblock that required you to go break pots until you earned enough money to progress right in the game's first area. Now, though, it just feels like an artifact of that earlier, much worse design. I think just leaving it on a table somewhere in Wings Rest or on the floor in the room where you meet Demi would feel better. This is a nitpick, though, of course. The writing of Lunacid is another plus. It's dialed back on the horror, but it's still full of charming characters and laugh-out-loud funny moments. I love this skeleton, Clive. That's not his name, it's just what everyone calls him. Another plus for me is that the game feels like it's delivering on a lot of the hidden story elements from Lost in Vivo as well. The game isn't out yet, so it's hard to draw any direct connections with 100% certainty, but I feel as though the Great Old One who awakens in the game's opening crawl has to be by a Gototh, or at least an entity related to it. Given the way this game's world has ancient, decrepit, modern technology, which implies the world used to be very much like our own before disaster struck, with items like VHS tapes being hidden around the world, I'm fully operating under the assumption that the game is set after Lost in Vivo's nightmare ending. Satyrus, one of the boss encounters from Lost in Vivo, is also directly referenced in one of the stories which Clive will tell you when you return to Wing's Rest. Lunacid is one of the best dungeon crawlers of the past decade, and that's without even having seen the full game. The levels are really evocative and interesting, the monster designs are great, especially as you get deeper into the game and its secret areas. Even if you have no affinity for classic PS1, PS2 era dungeon crawlers, you should absolutely give the game a try. 
The early access price was $7, an insane value, and I believe from my research that the game will now in version 1.0 cost $14 instead, which just from what I've seen in early access, it absolutely justifies, and then some. Whether you're a longtime fan of the games it's trying to emulate, or you've never played a dungeon crawler before, I think it's 100% worth your time. It somehow manages to walk that tightrope of being accessible to newcomers, while also feeling true to its root and not dumbing down the genre with a ton of hand-holding. Lunacid has been among my most anticipated games since I first heard of it. I bought it the day it hit early access, and I'm dying to play the 1.0 version myself. Give it a try. If anything I've said about it sounds interesting to you, I don't think you'll be disappointed. And with that, I've run out of games by Akamakira to talk about. As far as I can tell, that's every game Kira has publicly released. I hope I've made a case here for why these games are special, and why it's worth going back and playing through them. At the very least, I hope you've heard about something here today that's caught your interest, that you want to go play. I think these games all deserve more attention, especially the weirder and more obscure stuff like Uctena 64 or Basilisk 2000, which I've never seen any video essays discussing or getting major coverage. I really respect that none of the games I've talked about today are like each other. Spooky's House of Jump Scares was a legit hit. It's still certainly the most well-known game Kira's ever released. It would have been really easy for Kira to just make that game again seven or eight more times, and it probably would have been more profitable, too. Instead, they went on to make Lost in Vivo, which is so different from Spooky's it's not even recognizably from the same creator. Then they went on to make Uctena 64, which again, bears no resemblance to anything Kira had made before. Corpse Ocean is unique. Lunacid is unique. Even Basilisk 2000 is a completely different beast from its predecessor. Even Spooky's two DLCs are completely different, not only from each other, but from the game they exist as a part of. The only games in this entire video that actually feel like they're treading the same ground are The Undying Beast and Virgilius, and both of them are bite-sized freeware games, so I don't really think it's worth counting that against them. I think being willing to experiment, being willing to not just make the same thing over and over again, is a sign of artistic integrity. And it should not only be recognized, but praised. I think all of the games in this video are worth being proud of. Even the ones I was lukewarm on, like Minecraft or Sin, because they show a willingness to experiment. A courage to get things wrong, but to make something unique instead of making the most generic, polished, widely digestible content possible. What that ethos has resulted in is one of the strongest lineups of games by any indie horror creator working right now. That should be celebrated. These games should be shared, they should be seen, and they should be talked about. They deserve it. Friends, I want to thank you for making it this far into the video. This has been a very long one, but I appreciate you sticking through it with me all the way here to the end. If you made it this far, you clearly liked the video. I hope. That or you are making decisions with your time, that confuse me. If this is your first video on my channel, I'm Zuldem. I make content about things I like, usually games, often horror. I have videos about other creepy games on my channel you might like checking out, like one about Signalis or one about the Fear and Hunger games. I also make videos about the Hitman games, where I go over each level in extreme detail, and videos about the story of the game Final Fantasy XIV. I've also recently started doing weekly, minute-long micro-reviews of indie horror games as YouTube shorts, mostly to highlight weird but cool projects that I can't necessarily dedicate a full video to. If that sounds like something you'd like, go check it out. Before I let you go, I'd like to thank my patrons and my YouTube channel members, who have dedicated their real-life hard-earned cash to help me make these videos possible. Rekka, Rachel Aurelia, Sir Darkon, Florine, Rachel Judith Chumnus, David Duran, Alex Smith, Pikayoon, Alex Stewart, Hakan Boyum, Pete Lee, Jake G, Nitind, Shiny Empty Head, Lucos Craden. That's all. Alex, Bell Mage, Malachi Murphy, 
and Dunio. Seriously guys, it means so much to me that people like these videos, not just enough to watch them, but actually to give money to help me make more. Thank you so, so much. If you'd like to get your name read out at the end of videos, please check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash Zuldim, or click the join button in the description below. You also get access to special supporter exclusive videos. I recently posted a video discussing the story of Yulemore from the game Final Fantasy XIV, but if you're here for horror content, I have a video from a few months ago talking in depth about The King in Yellow, the short story collection that served as the foundation for the cosmic horror genre, later inspiring authors like H.P. Lovecraft. I usually like to tease other videos that are coming soon at the end here, but I'll be honest with you guys. I don't know what's coming next right now. This video was a spur of the moment thing. I got really excited when I found out Lunacid had a release date and I replayed all of these games, wrote this 55 page script, recorded and edited this video in the span of about three weeks because I hate myself, I guess. So for right now, I'm gonna go take a little lie down. I am very tired. And this is just me talking after the recording phase of the project. There will be more videos coming soon. They'll be cool, I think. Until next time, I'm Zoldum, and I'll see you in the next one.